Welcome back, dear friends, to the Crimson Academy's course of Glimpses of Light. Dear friends, let us find out who we will be covering tonight. We are in episode three. Dr. Helen Elsie Austin. Wonderful. And we have a special treat for you. Let us hear from her in her own words. Every human being born into this world begins a lifetime adventure of becoming and overcoming the challenges of human experience. We are led to faith, a spiritual experience which both guides and empowers us to choose the values which promote through action and reaction the development of human beings and human society. The need to meet and overcome experiences of injustice, oppression, animosity is part of the human environment. And perspective in understanding what goes on in life has helped me to meet the challenges of human experience more successfully and has counteracted the feelings of revenge and the susceptibility to hatred which comes so naturally. The courage and commitment to reject that which is false and unjust involves a transforming spiritual power. And it is in this sense, every human being is potentially the light of the world or its darkness. Dr. Helen Elsie Austin. These are some pictures of African-Americans during the period of injustice, slavery, inhumanity. The period in which my childhood and adolescence occurred was a climate quite different from what you know today. That was a time when there were no laws to protect the individual or a community of minority status. For an African American, there was a daily encounter with rejection, danger, and persecution based on prejudice and hostility. African American survival in this period was based on using the defenses they had developed during the period of slavery. They learned to pool their strength in their segregated schools and churches and other improvement organizations where they were able to develop and promote the spirit of self-help and to devise educational measures which stimulated a sense of self-worth and dignity and action to persevere in overcoming obstacles and to achieve excellence. Once, the Ku Klux Klan broke into her great-grandmother's house. They pointed guns at her and demanded to know where her husband was. She looked them in the eye and said, go ahead and kill me because I'll never tell you where he is. They eventually gave up and left. Mentor's election made him a target for the Ku Klux Klan 
and there were few nights when he could get to his home and be with his family. As the story goes, one night when my great-grandmother Louisa was alone with just her children, the clan came to her house, broke in the door, pointing guns at her, they demanded that she tell them where her husband was. She looked them in the eye, she said, just go ahead and kill me because I will never tell you where he is. After more curses and threats and shots, they decided not to kill her and left. I was awed and inspired by that story, by her courage, a lone woman in a hostile, dangerous environment and her determination not to give in to injustice and oppression, even at the risk of death. And I have in certain incidents of my life been reminded and relied upon the memory of her courage and her strength. Dr. Austin, born May 10th, 1908, passed away October 26, 2004, was born in Alabama. Both her parents worked at the Tuskegee Institute. Her father served as Commandant of Men. When the family moved to Ohio, her mother worked at Stowe School. Dr. Austin graduated from Walnut Hills High School, Cincinnati, Ohio in 1924. And here's a picture of Walnut Hills High School at that time. And here's a picture, dear friends, of Walnut Hills High School class picture, 1923. And you can see pictured in the top right, Elsie Austin. Elsie Austin was one of only two black students in her high school class in Ohio. One day, her teacher read from a textbook that Africans had played no important role in history and were inferior to other races. Everyone stared at the black students. Elsie spoke up. She said that Africans had worked with iron and bronze long before Europeans, and they crafted beautiful ivory sculptures. There was an electric silence, Elsie recalled. But her teacher agreed with her and shared other contributions by African Americans. Can you imagine? Two little black girls in a school full of white children, in a classroom full of white children. And with all the candor and cruelty of the young, the entire class looked at us. And there were, of course, a few snickers and grins. It was then that I remembered my grandmother I felt as if the Klan was standing there with the guns trained on me. With great resentment and resolve, I stood up and said, I was taught in a black school that Africans worked iron before Europeans knew anything about it. I was taught that they knew how to cast bronze in making statues and that they worked in gold and in ivory so beautifully that the European nations came to their shores to buy their carvings and statues. That's what I was taught in a black school. There was an electrical silence. But friends, can you imagine if there had been no protest what ingrained prejudice and hostility would have been implanted 
in the minds of those children. And what humiliation and degradation would have been stamped upon us. Here's a picture, dear friends, of Dr. Helen Elsie Austin in her yearbook photo from Walnut Hills High School, 1924. And here it says, nothing is impossible to industry. She was a member of the Junior Debating Club, Special Chorus. And here is a quote from her. With heart that is light and so gay, Elsie goes dancing her way. As an artist, she's fine and portraits her line. That she's bright there is none will gainsay. And here again is another Walnut Hills High School class picture, Elsie Austin in the top right. In 1928, Elsie entered the University of Cincinnati as a member of the first integrated undergraduate class. When she arrived on campus, Elsie and seven other African-American women students were brought into the administrator's office in that session. And they were told not to be conspicuous, reminded that they belonged to a subject race and advised to have low expectations for their academic success. We were young, sensitive, full of hope and aspiration for university education. That speech traumatized us. We sat down and discussed the situation. And then all eight of us decided that we were going out for everything in the university. We almost took an oath in blood that we were all to finish that first year with honors in something. By the end of the year, each one of us did take an honor. And at the beginning of the next year, that same official who had called us in and insulted us apologized for her remarks. Here is a picture of Helen Elsie Austin in the 1928 yearbook photo for the Interracial Club at the University of Cincinnati. She was among seven other black women in her year in that club. They were not the first two black people to attend, but were an increase from the one to two, three per year since 1904. And one of those previous attendees was Elsie Austin's aunt. Dr. Austin received a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1928 and a Bachelor of Laws degree in 1930 from the University of Cincinnati, becoming the first black woman to graduate from the University of Cincinnati Law School, as well as the eighth president of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And here's pictures in the newspapers, the Cincinnati Inquirer, Cincinnati, Ohio, dated 4th January, 1937. And here it says, Miss Austin, the first Negro woman graduated from the College of Law at the University of Cincinnati will be the first of her race and sex to be named an assistant to the Attorney General of Ohio. She will take the office next Monday. And here, dear friends, is a picture of Dr. Helen Elsie Austin. It says, if the court please, this was in the Pittsburgh Courier in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, dated 14th January, 1933. It says, if the court please, so clever, attorney Elsie Austin earns her daily bread pleading before the bar of justice in Cincinnati, Ohio, 
She says she likes her job. Dr. Austin receives first honorary doctorate of laws, 1937, Wilbur Force University. And here's a newspaper clipping of this um, stating it. And it is March 17, 1937. It says, Wilbur Force University today refused to reveal the recipients of five honorary degrees to be distributed at the inauguration ceremonies Thursday for Dr. D. O. Walker, new president. From Columbus, it was learned that Miss Elsie Austin, Cincinnati, member of the university board would receive an honorary doctorate of laws degree. She is on the staff of attorney general. Dr. Austin was on the staff of the Rocky Mountain Law Review and of the Cincinnati Law Review. She received a Doctor of Laws degree from Wilbur Force University. She was the first black woman to serve as Assistant Attorney General in Ohio, 1937 to 1938, and became legal advisor to the District of Columbia government in 1939. Elsie was frustrated by religions that fought with each other and acted with prejudice. She told her father that she was giving up on religion. He had heard of the local Baha'is and their mission of unity, and he encouraged Elsie to talk to them. I remember at this point how I became a Baha'i. I was young angry, incensed, and hostile. I went to my father and I said, I'm going to become an agnostic or an atheist because I just don't believe anymore in these religions that are all separate, all fighting with each other, all enforcing prejudice against some group. And yet they say God is the father of all mankind. My father heard me out and then said, well, before you do it, why don't you go and talk to these Cincinnati people who are talking about the Baha'i faith? He was not a Baha'i, but he said they have some very interesting views, and maybe that will interest you. So I went and talked to the Baha'is. I took their literature around for two years to find things to argue about, and my confirming experiences were the activities and the attitudes of so many wonderful Baha'is who helped me overcome my bitterness. There was Mr. Lewis Graybury who taught classes about the faith with culture, with gentility and forcefulness that impressed everybody. There was Dorothy Baker in Lima an atmosphere which was like a setting for the Ku Klux Klan, so rigid and so mean. But Dorothy Baker opened her home for Baha'i firesides, to which came black and white inquirers from surrounding areas who listened and became attracted to the teachings. As she said, for two years, Elsie studied the faith. She found African-American speakers and musicians for a race amity conference in 1935. Afterwards, she became a Baha'i. She wrote that the faith begins with that essential spiritual regeneration of the human being, which creates a heart for brotherhood and impels action for the unity of mankind. And dear friends, this is a newspaper clipping of the conference, the Amity Conference that she attended if shortly before she declared her belief in 1935. And it says here, conference to be held on Amity between races, meeting scheduled at w YWCA. Preparations have been completed for a three-day race Amity Conference 
of the Cincinnati Baha'i Assembly to be held at the YWCA 9th and Walnut Streets beginning Thursday, April 11th. It was announced yesterday. The purpose of the conference is to establish a greater feeling of goodwill between peoples and races. Dr. Austin joined the Baha'i Faith in 1935 and met Hands of the Cause, Dorothy Baker and Louis Gregory. Here's a picture, dear friends. This is in 1953, the Hand of the Cause of God, Dorothy Baker, seated in the center, attended the Baha'i International Conference in Kampala, Uganda. To her right, you can see Elsie Austin who represented the U.S. National Spiritual Assembly at the conference. So you can see the picture of them together. In 1946, this is a picture of the Los Angeles Baha'i Center at 331 South New Hampshire. This is the first gathering of Baha'is in Los Angeles, and they were held in the homes of individual believers. As their numbers grew, they began to rent space for their meetings. And during the 1930s and 40s, space was rented in the Halliburton Building on 8th Street in downtown Los Angeles. In 1946, a large residential property at 311 South New Hampshire Avenue was purchased. And we can see Dr. Helen Elsie Austin in this picture. And she's in the front row wearing that black hat. You can see her in the, right up in the front. This is when uh, she was visiting the community. November 1946, the Los Angeles Spiritual Assembly, together with then National Spiritual Assembly member Elsie Austin, later to earn the title of Knight of Baha'u'llah, pioneering to Morocco, you can see her left on the left side, Dr. Helen Elsie Austin. And then the names of the others, Virginia Foster, Charles McAllister, Oni Finks, Olive Dibble, Mertie Barnes, Willard Hatch, Robert Dice, Georgina Fitzgerald, and Sadie Ellis. So this is the Los Angeles Spiritual Assembly meeting with Helen Elsie Austin. Dr. Helen Elsie Austin was elected to the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States in 1946. Here is a picture of those wonderful members serving that august body, National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States in Canada at the 1946 annual Baha'i Convention, Wilmette, Illinois. And you can see Ms. Helen Elsie Austin is, seat, is standing second from the right. From 1946 through 1953, Elsie Austin was a member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. And here we can see her standing. And this is a picture of the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States, 1953. Dr. Elsie Austin said, the battle we face is essentially a spiritual battle to transform the souls and spirits of human beings, to empower them to express love and justice. After her pilgrimage to Haifa, Dr. Austin pioneered to Morocco in 1953, gaining status as a Knight of Baha'u'llah. While teaching at the American School of Tangier in Morocco, 1954 to 57, she helped establish Baha'i communities in Northern and Western Africa. She said that through such an experience, you begin to understand how much oneness there is with humanity, 
and how much people in other parts of the world are going through the same experiences that you go through in your homeland. And here's a beautiful picture, dear friends, of Elsie Austin on the right, and Hand of the Cause of God, Enoch Olinga, second from the left at the International Teaching Conference, Kampala, Uganda, February 1953. And this is another picture, Elsie Austin. And she, we can see her at the right of women carrying the umbrella. She's right in the center in the, on the right. And she is the right, on the right side of the woman carrying the umbrella. That's how I would put it. In a group of Baha'is, including hands of the cause, Tarazullah Samandari, he's wearing the dark hat at the right. You can see him standing, dark hat at the right. Leroy Ayes, he's wearing a jacket and tie in the center. Zikrullah Khadem, at the left of Mr. Ayes, and Ali Akbar Frutan, wearing spectacles at right of Mr. Ayes. And Hassan Baliuzi, later appointed a hand of the cause of God, is at the center rear. And this was a picture taken in Kampala, Uganda, 1953. What a precious picture. And there we can also see Mrs. Violet Nachjavani in the picture here. Incredible group of friends. Here's a, pic, uh, a newspaper clipping of Miss Elsie Austin. This is in the Pittsburgh Courier. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 26 June, 1954. Now, imagine this, dear friends. This is long before even the Civil Rights Movement, 1954, talking about an African-American woman in the newspaper. Now, listen to this. This is what it says. Beautiful Elsie Austin. Beautiful Elsie Austin in Tangiers, Morocco, is plotting a series of articles on her experiences. Pittsburgh's Loretta McAllister weekended in hometown Cincinnati in time to be one of the guests at the elegant bridge luncheon given at the Mons Hotel by Dayton's Mrs. Earl Campbell and Columbus, Mrs. John Bailey, our town's Royal and Madeline Parker vacationing in Atlantic City with Wakefield Huffington. But I believe the part says, beautiful Elsie Austin in Tangiers, Morocco is plotting a series of articles on her experiences. And there's a picture of Elsie Austin there. I find it fascinating that the author of this newspaper clipping chose the word beautiful to address Elsie Austin in this, at that point, at that time, in the newspaper. It's amazing what a soul she was. Here's Elsie Austin seated left front left, with other members of the Baha'i community of Tangiers, Morocco, February 1954. In 1955, Dr. Austin wrote Above All Barriers, the story of Louis G. Gregory, reprinted in 1964 and 1976. And we find small little short a description about the author, Elsie Austin, in it. And it says, Elsie Austin, who has written this moving tribute, is herself a distinguished person. She served as cultural attache with the U.S. Department of State at Lagos, Nigeria, for several English and French-speaking nations of West Africa. Prior to going to Africa, she served four years as executive director of the National Council of Negro Women, eight years on the National Administrative Board of the Baha'i Faith in the United States, the National Spiritual Assembly, and was the first woman of her race to hold the office of Assistant Attorney General in Ohio. As a Baha'i, she has worked many years for world peace and order through the principles of the oneness of all mankind and the universality of religious truth. And here is another picture of 
Dr. Elsie Austin. You can see her in the center wearing a coat and holding a frame. And she is with women attending the first Baha'i Convention in Tunis, Tunisia, 1956. Dr. Austin was elected to the National Spiritual Assembly of Northwest Africa and helped elect the first Universal House of Justice in 1963. And here we see a picture of Dr. Helen Elsie Austin is holding the frame of the Esmazam National Spiritual Assembly of Northwest Africa, 1956. In addition to her pioneering and service at the national level, Dr. Austin served on local spiritual assemblies in five countries, United States, Morocco, Nigeria, Kenya, and the Bahamas, and also served as one of the first members of the auxiliary board assisting the hand of the cause, Musa Panani. In 1958, she was appointed executive director of the National Women's Council. In 1960, Elsie became a foreign service officer, working with cultural and educational programs of the United States Information Agency in Nigeria and Kenya. And here, dear friends, we have a newspaper clipping. This is in the Cincinnati Inquirer in dated 12 January 1969, and it says, helping the African women. And it's a picture of Miss Elsie Austin, former Cincinnatian, has worked in Africa for the United States Information Agency for eight years. It's a whole article. And this article was published 12 January 1969. She received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from the University of Cincinnati in 1969. So this is her second honorary doctorate, the first we talked about. The same university named a scholarship in her honor in 2000. And here's the newspaper clipping, and this is in the Cincinnati Inquirer, dated May 7th, 1969. It says 12 to get honorary degrees at 150th University Cincinnati June commencement. And here's, uh, I blew it up. It says University of Cincinnati will confer the greatest number of honorary degrees in its history at its 150th commencement, June 15th. The board of directors Tuesday approved a list of eight alumni, two former faculty members and two executives with public service records. Alumni to be honored include Mrs. Helen Elsie Austin, attorney, first regional affairs officer in West Africa for the US Information Agency, first Negro woman graduate of the University of Cincinnati College of Law. Dr. Austin, retired from the Foreign Service in 1970. In 1975, Dr. Austin chaired the Baha'i delegation to the International Women's Conference in Mexico City. In 1982, Dr. Austin worked with the Phelps Stokes Fund in China, inspecting schools, businesses, and community services affecting education and opportunities for minorities. She lived in Silver Spring, Maryland, before moving to San Antonio, Texas in June 2004. Here's a picture of Elsie Austin, circa 1970, with Firuz Kazimzadeh of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. Here's a news paper clipping says black woman to be speaker for human rights session and this is in the Oshkosh Northwestern 
in the Oshkosh, Wisconsin, dated 7th December 1973. It says, Dr. H. Elsie Austin will speak on humanness rediscovered at a public lecture Sunday at 7.30 p.m. at the Reeve Memorial Union Lounge in observance of Human Rights Day. Her appearance is being sponsored by the Baha'i community of Oshkosh. She will also speak at 2 p.m. on the day at the Conway Motel Appleton on the subject, Is Justice Possible in This Disintegrating Society? A member of the Baha'i faith, Ms. Austin served more than 10 years in African countries, the major portion of that time as a foreign service officer working with the cultural and educational programs sponsored by the United States Information Agency. She participated in 10 international conferences and seminars sponsored by United Nations agencies and other international groups in Africa. The first black woman graduate of the law school of University of Cincinnati. She also was the first black woman to serve as assistant attorney general of Ohio. She recently served as guest lecturer at Tulane University for the Law Students Society and was a pioneer in formation of the First World Crusade of the Baha'i Faith. Honorary doctor's degrees have been conferred on her by University of Cincinnati and Wilberforce University. This was published 7th December 1973. And here's a picture of her at that age. In a 1998 lecture, Dr. Austin said that Baha'is constitute a unique world community, one that is operating in every part of the world where there is tension, violence, and hatred. We are making a serious effort to pry human beings away from their alienating traditions, their comfortable ignorance, and their prejudice but we must try harder. Dr. Austin never wavered in her own resolve to try harder, but rather redoubled her efforts over the decades. Elsie continued to speak and write about the faith until her passing in 2004 at age 96. United States National Spiritual Assembly praised her natural, unaffected dignity and a sincere, loving interest in the doings of her fellow human beings. The Universal House of Justice wrote that her shining example will remain a source of inspiration to her fellow believers for generations to come. Let's hear from her one last time. The essential for peace is unity of conscience. Why? Because unity of conscience makes us willing to be just, to give the other fellow his due. And I hope we will continue to work with all the inward and outward obstacles in developing that unity of conscience in ourselves and in all we can touch. The time for transformation is now. I think there is a Baha'i prayer that can offer us guidance, strength, and determination. It is prayer which talks about protest, it talks about faith, and it talks about progress. And it goes, quote, O oh God, aid thy servants to raise up the word, to refute what is vain and false, to establish the truth, to spread the sacred verses abroad, and to make the morning's light to dawn in the hearts of the righteous. And I don't know what we're waiting for, 
but we should be galvanized into action because now is the time as the saying goes if not now when thank you very much and thank you very much dear friends that was another session of glimpses of light